Now, stop. Welcome to chapter 13, the news media. Before all of this, we've, we've gone through the gambit. Of course, we learned how the Constitution was created. We understand our protections under the Constitution and our rights under the Constitution. We have studied the different institutions under the Constitution. In the last several chapters, starting with chapter 10, we learned what political opinion was. Basically, it's usually exercised when voting. We understood what uh, uh, political parties were. Political parties is just when people with ideology from their political socialization decide to use their public opinion and take action and join groups and become partisan. We talked about campaigns, election, and voting, how partisanship affects all of that, what it takes to run for office, and the stages of running for office. Now, usually when those parts are discussed, I usually like to talk about interest groups, which we will talk about in chapter 14 soon. However, I can understand talking about the news media first before interest groups, because when we talk about political opinion and opinion polls involved, the media uses those things as the most to get an understanding of what people think, not only about politics in general, but their reporting as well. When people are partisan and make a decision about what party or group to join, the news media loves this as well. And we'll report the news on party politics either way. The news media is highly involved when we talk about campaigns, elections, and voting. During the campaign process, especially for president, the media is ever present, no matter who the candidate is. Even from the most weakest and obscure candidate, such as the senator from Illinois back in 2007, to the most well-known and famous candidate such as a TV personality back in 2015. And after a person has been elected to office, uh, be it as president, member of Congress, state legislator, governor, mayor, city council, school board, what have you, the news media is ever present. The news media continues to report the news no matter what but as of late, due to technology changes, the news media itself has become more ideological divided or more partisan divided. Now, this is kind of a 360 because when the news media started out in America, in the States, it was very partisan or it was based on ideological groups. And those groups delivered to those people that believed in them, the news under their slant or under their frame. If, if it wasn't for news media, there wouldn't be a US constitution today and there wouldn't be a US government, reason being, in order to sell the general public on the US Constitution, founding fathers wrote the Federalist Papers. These were essays. These were essays that were printed in pamphlets and printed in newspapers. And printed in newspapers in states in which they knew members of the legislature would read and it would influence their decision on whether to ratify the Constitution. News media 
is the only industry that is mentioned in the Constitution as being a protected industry, which is amazing. The freedom of speech and the freedom of press are both under the First Amendment. The freedom of the press is the only industry mentioned at all. Because in order to have a republic, a strong republic, you must have free flow of ideas. You must have news media. But unfortunately, even news media can generate a false narrative, a type, a narrative that can be destructive, that may actually have to be governed. And when it's governed incorrectly, or when, when incorrect news is delivered, you can have a repeat of what happened on 6th of January, 2021. So let's move forward with chapter 13, the news media. We'll start here with my PowerPoint. And you know how I love PowerPoint. But I will use this as a guide for what we're covering here. Chapter 13, the news media. The learning objectives today is to describe the structure and functions of the media, past and present, assess the influence of the media on America, analyze the impact of the media on public opinion and political behavior, and summarize the ethical standards and federal regulations that govern the news media, and describe the effect of recent trends in the news media on political outcomes. Now, the roots of the news media in the Constitution, print media, radio news, TV news, digital media. Print media. The first colonial newspapers were printed in 1690. The value of a free press was recognized very early. In the United States, we had states that allowed free press. Now, some of them did not. But yes, most of them did. The penny press were just simply newspapers that cost a penny. Like the New York Sun. Guess what? New York Sun still exists. Sensational and scandalous. It was a tabloid. Payoffs are common in yellow journalism. Now understand, the New York Sun today is a very scandalous sensational press. Back in the day when the media was coming up, they would pay for stories from not only the participants of who were they reporting, but to politicians. But during the period between uh, 1880 to 1920, there's something called yellow journalism, mainly created by uh, by at the time, uh, the greatest uh, newspaper or media uh, tycoon in history, the first person to ever put together a mass media on a multi-level multi scale was uh, Randolph Hearst. And he created yellow journalism. His yellow journalism was one of the reasons why we fought the Spanish uh, American War. So the news media has been around for a time and has influenced the ideas of Americans for, for centuries. Muckraking, exposing misconduct. Well, the kind of misconduct that muckraking usually what expose would be would be those personal oh how should i say it moral 
indiscretions, especially during the, the early 1900s. Muckraking was funny uh, out if a politician was having an affair with someone else. And that was either reported or threatened to report. Now, radio news came, came about. Radio was, radio was uh, really invented in the late 1800s, was mainly used by governments and ships in the early 1900s. By 1920, uh, radio sets have become smaller. Well, they were basically a size of, 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 a, of a chair, of a tall chair, set about maybe four, five foot high and wide, full of vacuum tubes. But they were affordable and they were coming into homes. And in the 1920s, we had our first radio uh, companies like ABC, CBS, NBC. Now, the first president to really exploit the technology of, of radio was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. During the Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in a way he could touch or connect with, with his constituents uh, throughout the country, is to have fireside chats. At times, he was talking to uh, the American public every day. Most of the times, once a week, sometimes once a month. Got to the point where everybody, there were many people so tired of hearing his name or just tired of hearing his voice. But what FDR did by having these fireside chats, it was the first time in history of the world that anyone on a mass scale heard the voice of their leader and they felt how their leader reached out to them and to guide them through a difficult time like the depression. Now an invention that was created in the early 1920s first demonstrated in late 1928, eventually caught on. And after, the, and after the Second World War, television started its, its ascendancy. By the 1950s, uh, the late 1950s, television was the dominant media in, a con in, in the United States. And most people watched it. Case in point, if it wasn't for television, the civil rights movement would have failed. That's right, I said that. If it wasn't for television, the civil rights movement would have failed because the images that came from the protests, the images that came from the action of the police against protesters were profound on the American public. And it caused, it caused the American public to shift their ideas uh, away from what they thought was normal when dealing with race relations. If it wasn't for these things, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would have never happened. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 would have never happened. The Civil Rights Acts of 1968 would have never happened. And the educational components of the Civil Rights Act that came in 1972, that gave a women fair shake in education uh, uh, activities would have never occurred. So television, television uh, was the great equalizer in touching the lives of of, of millions of people. It also brought about the end of the Vietnam War. Now, let's backtrack. Back in the 1930s, when radio was coming out, there was something created called the Fairness Doctrine. That means individuals who broadcasted 
on any radio channel must provide equal time for the alternative voice to speak if there were any political discussions. This also applied to television and in newspapers due to, due to uh, the professional professionalization of newspapers uh, in the early 1900s as uh, journalism were being taught in universities and colleges around the country, both sides of the opinion were required as a journalism standard. But in the late 1980s, under the Reagan administration, the fairness doctrine was repealed. That opened up a wide range of possibilities for political media. So when the fairness doctrine came about, everything was equal. One political, one political opinion uh, uh, was stated and, and the equal or, or opposite political opinion can occur. Essentially, critically thinking was allowed for everyone, but now without the fairness doctrine, one political voice, depending on the ideology of the owners of the radio, could reign supreme. Get back to it. So television news was gradually replaced by print radio. Network versus cable news came about in the late 80s, C-SPAN. C-SPAN is a public uh, cable channel which shows congressional and political news out of Washington. Now, when network cable news started. It started in the early 1980s. CNN was the first one. And I can tell you personally, my world expanded when CNN came to being. Here I'm this little black boy from Southwest Oklahoma. And I was able, thanks to CNN, to see the world. Not only my country, but the world. And it was the standard bearer, uh, uh, standard bearer of news for me for most of my young life. Now I have other sources because CNN has changed. It has become somewhat partisan. But at the time, CNN was the place to go. Now, digital media came about Starting in 1968, 69, uh, the internet was, or the funding for the internet was passed and the internet system was created. The internet was given over to public use in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s. And in the mid 1990s, the internet exploded. with blogs, billboards, and chat rooms. Eventually websites came on and self-service websites began. And in, 2000, and in 2005, Facebook started. And in 2007, guess what started? The iPhone. And with these inventions and with these allowances by the government, social media and the internet exploded because now with these devices, you can pretty much go anywhere and be connected to uh, what you wanna see on the internet, what you wanna see on your blog, what you wanna see in social media. So now we have a number of people 
will receive their news from social media and the internet, which changed the whole scale. Now, how the news media cover politics, how the press and public figures interact, covering the presidency, Congress, and the Supreme Court. How the press and public figures interact. All right, press release. When most congressional or most leaders talk to the public, they send out an official document called the press release, basically stating their position. It's usually a lot of things that's usually not a, full, a lot of full de details, but it provides, but it provides information that that leader wants to get out to the public. A press briefing, press secretary represents officials, question and answer sessions. So uh, a press briefing usually occurs between uh, the press where they all sit and ask questions to either a leader or to the leader's representatives, and it's a Q&A session. A press conference, general Q&A with an official. So if the leader is just having a press conference over and over, it's just a Q&A. That's it. That's how a public figure communicates with the public. Now, Let's look at the president, and it's always fun to look at the president. This is how the president usually communicates with the public through press release, press briefing, press conference. Now we know through uh, social media like Twitter, Facebook, what have you. But this is where presidents truly have power. As we talked about in Chapter, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chapter seven. The press have all, has a lot of enumerated and implied powers from the Constitution and whatever that Congress may delegate to the president. But the president's true power is to persuade the public. That's right. The president when the president wants to get a policy through Congress, wants to force the hand of members of Congress, the president will either have a press release, a press briefing, a press conference, use social media and to communicate directly to the public to say, hey, pass my legislation through Congress. Call your member of Congress and force their hand. That's how a president communicates. And that is the true power of the president. Yes, the president may be commander in chief, but the president can't do anything really without Congress passing the president's policies. Covering the presidency receives most media coverages, prestigious posts for a reporter, and daily Q&A with the press secretary. Covering Congress, it's usually a very logistical challenge because you have 535 members of Congress that you have to report on. That means 435 people from the House of Representatives and 100 senators. So in order to cover all these people, it's a nightmare. So it's easier to focus on the president, focus on party leaders in Congress is easier to cover Congress that way. Because usually most members of Congress allow the party leaders to speak for them. Coverage is mostly negative, yes. Focus on scandal and conflict in Congress is mostly negative. You see today, when the press, be it on social media, be it on cable news, be it on in the newspaper or be it on TV, being on radio. It's always about conflict in Congress, how they're not getting things done, blah, 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 blah. This continues to feed to the public. And many members of the public hate it, but yet this conflict is being caused by the public 
because the public continues to elect people who don't work together. So if they don't like what they hear in the media about Congress, vote someone in there that will allow Congress to work together. Covering the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, as it says here, is a media vacuum. No TV cameras are permitted. Few reporters cover the court and complex legal issues are harder to present. And justices rarely grant interviews, rarely grant. Covering the third branch of government is hard because it's a very technical branch. You can't just say, give a sound bite from the Supreme Court or any of the lower courts because it wouldn't give you the entire story. Justices are more about the law instead of by seeing themselves on TV or on the internet. And because Supreme Court and lower court decisions only come out during certain times of the year or a month, it only required a few uh, reporters there. The news media influence and news media bias and public confidence. News media influence, new media bias, public confidence. The media effects influencing public opinion. They set the agenda, framing, and greater influence. Now, what this means is this. The media affects public opinion. Your public opinion, your political opinion is affected by what you see, read, or hear in the media. So if someone tells you today that Joe Biden protects his son, Hunter Biden, by being the president and to cover up any crimes that he may have done, done. Now, if you were to hear this out of some left field media, most of you wouldn't care. But there would be a few of you would care because our natural suspicion of government would make us care. But let's just say uh, Joe Biden tripped on the red carpet coming from Air Force One. Now the media may cover this and the first thing and depend on the partisanship of the media, some would say, and if, if, uh, if it's just straight coverage, oh, the president tripped on the carpet like anybody else. The media that's more partisan towards the president was says the president had a little stumble, no big deal, or wouldn't even show the trip. But let's say the media that is partisan against the president. Ah, it shows Joe Biden is feeble. He's incompetent to serve. The news media affects your public opinion and what you watch Will, help, will tailor your thinking, tailor your political socialization. And will slowly change your public opinion, your political opinion and how you vote. Agenda setting. The media can set the agenda on what we should act. It will go out there and find a problem and introduce it to the public. And the public would know that is an issue that we need to resolve. It also puts politicians on notice that the public is interested in solving this issue. The agenda is set. So it influences issues addressed by government and it makes people move. Framing. Like the example for Joe Biden, it's all framed in context. It actually, like a picture. 
the media for uh, that's partisanship for uh, uh, Joe Biden will be framed as nothing really happened. Against may be framed as he's incompetent. Person reporting the news uh, objectively, oh, he tripped on the red carpet. Media also has a greater influence on foreign policy now because the information that we see receive throughout the world is delivered through the media. If we see starving people in, in Ethiopia, we see China massively moving upon uh, many countries in the Pacific. If we see Europe fighting amongst themselves, we see Mexico or Canada trying to struggle with border issues with us. Because of setting the agenda and shedding that light before the public, the news media has more influence on foreign policy of how government use, uh, how government address issues. News media bias, journalists like all people are biased. News media bias, you have an elite bias or a dramatic bias. An elite bias, they may show more elites, stars, political elites, may, may uh, uh, demonstrate their lives more or may frame a situation in the best light for them or a dramatic bias. It bleed, if it bleeds in the streets, it leads. In the black area town, they shooting again. Even though the last time someone shot, maybe a, yes, maybe a day ago, but it was just shot in the air. News media has all biases and it simply reflects the person who is reporting it. It simply reflects the news company that is broadcasting, it is simply reflecting the audience that is seeing, that is watching those broadcasts. News media stardom. We have members of the news media who are stars now. Think about it. On MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. On CNN, Don Lemon, on Fox News, Tucker Carlson, and many more. Unfavorable assessment and value watchable, a uh, value valuable watchdog role. People have an unfavorable assessment of the media because the perception is that the news stories are inaccurate and biased. Well, many of them are. It is very difficult to try to find one that is not. But remember, if you want to change the biasness of the news media, it is up to you. Remember, news media only does what it does to attract you. The news media gets paid by the sponsors that it has. The sponsors pay the salary of the people reporting. And the only reason why sponsors were, would, uh, would advertise on a media outlet is because you're watching or you are reading or you are hitting that website. But the news media also provides a watchdog role. It's one of the reasons why freedom of the press is in the Constitution. It's because the news media, the news media itself investigates government. It is that accountability when government fails, news media is there to make them accountable to the laws rules, regulations 
that is set for us, government is also accountable and news media will report it. Journalistic standards and government regulations, rules governing the news media. Journalism standards, some of the code of ethics, even though sometimes it seems like they don't have it, is to avoid conflicts of interest and verifying information. Well, conflicts of interest is if a news is if the person reporting the news is involved in that news story, other than being a reporter, it's a conflict of interest. Verifying information, making sure that the source or the information that you're reporting is true is required. As we know, a lot of people don't, don't do that. Dealing with sources on and off the record. Sometimes they talk to people off the record. And when they're on the record, fine. On background, they need to find what's happening, the backstory, what created this news. Deep background, undercover investigations, Inter internal media credits. There are people internal in news outlets of those legitimate news sources that use these standards to justify whether something should be printed, broadcast, or issued over the internet. Government regulations, the media ownership, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 basically made news media more wide open. Content, equal time rule. That was, that was once called the, I said it earlier, the fairness doctrine. Challenges in a di digital age, online privacy, piracy. People hijack stories. Towards reform current news and media trends. Private ownership ensures independence, but creates pressure to consolidate or eliminate competition. And when private ownership of news media occurs, you may not always get the unbiased proper news. The risk of consolidation is a limited flow of information, focus on sensational news and voting stories that might alienate or uh, alienate audiences audiences and executive. So a risk of consolidation of news media outlets can make it very limiting of the information received by you. Narrow casting, targeting specific populations, news audience divided along partisan lines, and appeals to pre-existing views. Basically, narrow casting is just news media focused on a specific group of people with specific type of news to satisfy specific types of beliefs. The best way to describe it is called an echo chamber. Basically, an echo chamber is the effect in which everyone around you says the same thing over and over. Everything you hear or encounter just simply reinforce your beliefs. And echo chambers are something that goes against critical thinking. And critical thinking requires that you take both sides of any story, look at the information clearly, investigate it, and come up with an informed decision. Narrow casting doesn't allow that. Infotainment is a blend of information and entertainment. Late night comedy shows, daytime talk shows, and comedy news shows. The greatest form of entertainment is when you see Rachel Maddow, Don Lemon, or Turco Carlson. Increased use of experts. When a news story happens, people use experts in certain fields, like political scientists. However, 
some of these experts at times are very biased to a specific partisan view of any subject. And when you see a lot of experts and depending on the pot and which channel, you can't tell who is telling the truth or not. But this is what you do. You look at the information that they're giving you and look it up. Verify what they're saying. And if the information is correct, then it's correct. Do not go to normal sources like you do. Don't look at Facebook to verify a source. Go out there, look at government documents. Look at documents from the scientists who are studying the problem. Look at research, look at people who are actually involved in the situation and find out what's going on. Citizen journalists. Citizen journalists are people or who call themselves journalists and they mostly report over social media or the internet and they bring the news to you from their perspective. It's usually on the scene coverage. It's cheaper than hiring reporters but it lacks objectivity. And sometimes the reporting is very inaccurate. So be careful when you get your news from citizen journalists. That's the end. Look, people, let's be, let's be honest here about the news media. The reason why freedom of the press is in the Constitution today is that we must have a free press to allow they, their reporting to keep government accountable. That is the reason with freedom of the press. But because the press must be profit driven in, in this country, which will not allow press organizations to be nonprofit. And because they are in competition with each other, and because social media has expanded, it is very difficult to find the straight news. I don't want, I, I have news sources that I trust that are clean. And I even double check them because the information that I see out there, I usually tell others and people actually trust the information that I give them. So I am very cognizant of what I say and what sources I look at. But the news media is valuable. The news media does need to be reformed. But the news media is all we have between ourselves and tyranny. Now, next on chapter 14, we're gonna be talking about uh, interest groups. Now, for those of you who have been listening to my rants about voting, this is where everything comes to head and how everything plays. So next time on chapter 14, will show you why certain populations have not been winning the ballot box and why certain populations don't get looked at at Congress as they should. But until next time, do your best, always critically think, and God bless you. And I will 